Hey, everyone. Welcome to Sum Zero. We are back with Ben Axler from Spruce Point Capital, um, recently named one of the top three short sellers on uh, Activist Insights magazine. Um, ben, great to have you back. Um, we're going to talk about C3 AI today, ticker AI. Uh, it seems like a pretty smart move on their part to, to take the AI ticker, but um, I, I know you've got some qualms with the stock. Um, so I, I don't want to get in the way. Why don't you um, get us started? I'm curious to hear how you came across the name um, and uh, just your, what your overall thesis is. Sure. Well, it reminds us of our, some of our success shorting iRobot. We, we've written a number of reports and campaigns against that gimmicky company, the ticker IRBT, um, kind of a one product uh, company, robotic vacuums. And you know, C3 AI kind of fits the same theme. I mean, uh, you know, the company came public last year and um, had some great uh, tailwinds, obviously, with a lot of interest in, in new technology stocks. But this isn't really a new tech story. This is almost an old tech story. The company has a long history, um, founded in 2009 by Tom Siebel, who had some success selling Siebel systems to Oracle. Um, initially, the company, um, you know, to design some energy management, grid management software. It was called C3 Energy. Then, uh, you know, that didn't really take hold. So they pivoted to C3 IoT when Internet of Things was the latest uh, tech trend. And, and now they've latched on to, to C3 AI um, and they came public at 40 something a share. And, uh, you know, the stock got up to 170 and, you know, insiders graciously cashed out. But you know, when we obviously dig into the story, what we see are, are a lot of problems. We, we see a company that has really failed to gain market, tr you know, traction and broad acceptance with the company. Um, a lot of the revenue is tied to one customer in a related party deal. That's Baker Hughes. Um, Baker Hughes took a 15% equity stake um, and they pledged, you know, minimum revenue guarantees whereby they would, they would you know, buy the software um, and use it, but then also agree to resell it to their oil and gas customers. And, you know, we we find some challenges there. And then, you know, with most of our shorts, obviously we're looking at the people, have a lot of issues with the governance structure. It's a dual class stock. Uh, a lot of the board we think is aligned with Mr. Siebel, not necessarily with public shareholders. And it's been a great enrichment vehicle for them. Um, but what we think is really left is a carcass of a company with uh, limited prospects, a lot of turnover and revenue estimates that are way too high, uh, built on a crowd foundation. Um, with one contract that we see ending soon and could be canceled. So before we get into, um, you know, all, all those points, um, and I think it's really interesting that you know, there seems to be like a customer concentration problem here, and there seems to be maybe a, um, a fundamental problem with the, the service they provide, but can you just give us some color on what they do and what, you know, when they call themselves, when they put AI in the name, what, what are they actually trying to be here? Is well, this like AWS of sorts, but only AI, or what? What is it? It's a real problem because people still don't seem to know. They, uh, this, the, the company presented at the Needham conference, and the first question that was asked is, you know, there's basically what do you guys do? Because no one seems to really understand. But I mean, they're positioning themselves as an enterprise AI platform, and you know, most of their customer base, is, which is fairly concentrated, and the pitch has been to large corporates. Um, so they've had, you know, 3M, Baker Hughes, Caterpillar, they've had some utilities and, you know, they're trying to solve or help companies predict, you know, perhaps, you know, downtime issues um, with assets or, or when assets might need to be, you know, repaired, um, a whole bunch of different, you know, business problems, um, so to speak. Uh, but the issue is, is that it's, the, the complexity of the product um, is sort of one of its limiting factors. So part of the reason why it hasn't gotten broad, more broadly adopted is because you're making a sale not only to a, a CTO and a CEO, but also you know, digital enterprise managers. And you really have to have a holistic you know, buy-in when you're going to spend $20, $25 million for this product. And so the complexity of it um, and the view that it's almost too technical to be adopted, I think is really been one of its limiting factors. So think of it what you will. I think what, what we really find is that despite all the buzz and hype, trying to find the actual product in the industry or broader adoption, it's just not there. So on that note, um, who are their customers now, at least the bigger ones, and 
where do you see fissures or cracks in those relationships? Is, are you starting to see kind of issues around renewals? Um, wh where are those cracks happening? Yeah, so, you know, part of the issue that we find and we believe is the customer mix is changing. I mean, historically, again, they've had somewhat of a um, concentrated customer base. They do report customer numbers, although in our report, we've, we've outlined why we think there's potentially customer overstatement here because some of the definitions they've used for what is a customer have changed. And in fact, you know, some of the definitions are so loose that pretty much they can, you know, deploy the product, but not be generating any revenues and consider that a customer. So, you know, in my, in my narrow view of the world, you have to be getting paid for the use of a product or service to be a customer. But I think, um, you know, what's clear is, uh, so Baker Hughes, getting back to Baker Hughes, they're the largest customer and reseller. Um, but what we found is um, they've had some cultural challenges and just um, challenges selling the product. And so that's that's generated three contract modifications and uh, C3 files, the, the contracts um, redacted. But each time, you know, as we look through, what, what's very clear is the revenue, the peak revenue guarantees keep getting pushed out farther and farther. So, you know, we've outlined this obviously on, on a slide in our Baker Hughes section, I think. I just have it pulled up right in front of me. Initially, when they inked this deal in 2019, you know, they were saying by 2022 they'd have 170 million of revenues. Um, this is rev you know, revenues being um, booked for, for C3. Now, the latest contract amendment, they're pushing it out to 125 million of revenue into 2025. And so that's kind of a clear example to us of you know, delays and adoptions and, and problems, you know, selling also the third amendment. You know, talked about price discounts, price concessions. Um, so these sort of things sort of you know get our you know attention, uh, uh, you know, focused on it. And we've obviously done some channel checks and spoke with former employees, knowledgeable. And and the view is that it's a marriage that's just not working. And so you know, when we look at the company, when we value the company, we we pretty much value it as a runoff of this Baker Hughes revenue stream, which ironically they're booking at 100% gross margin meaning they're not associating any costs with it. That we have a, a serious concern with. But even if you just you know, sort, of, sort of run a PV of this revenue stream running off um, and then look at the remaining customer base, which we think is with the market, the street analysts are extrapolating 40% growth, which we don't think is going to happen. Revenue estimates are way too high and we get you know, 40 to 50% 40 to 50 you know, downside target, um, just you know, sort of uh, valuing the existing business as is. You mentioned channel checks. Uh, can you walk through some of those that you've done? Sure. Well, as I mentioned, you know, we interviewed uh, former employees, people in the people in the AI space, trying to understand again where does this company, you know, fit in? What are the issues? And you know, I think the biggest issue that we're finding is, you know, the the organizational the organization is in um, I, I would describe it as a chaos mode right now. I mean, they've gone through three. CFO since filing to go public. Uh, they filed to go public in September of 2020, um, and the CFO who was initially listed on the registration document disappeared. Uh, then they brought in a new CFO who just left, and by the way, he forfeited $20 million of options, struck at $17.10 uh, a share. I mean, so we can only surmise what his view is. Um, he had to wait you know, uh, a year or two to get vested on that, but uh, he walked away from an uh, enormous uh, uh, option package there. And then, of course, the third CFO, uh, who's the current CFO they brought on, we, we found a pattern of, um, you know, aggressive uh, uh, practices. Uh, you know, he was the CFO of Telenav, which did a restatement um, uh, over the period that he was there. And obviously, we, we also found um, some issues of domestic violence charges in his background. So, you know, we think, you know, the, the, the management is in flux half the executive team has left in the past few months. The sales force, um, and these are these are high-level executives have been brought on from places from, you know, Accenture and other leading companies have come and they d disappear within a year. So we think, you know, fundamentally this 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 company is um, in disarray right now, and that's part of the, the 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 problem why we think you know the street estimates are just way too high for revenue with the Baker Hughes contract. You know, in jeopardy, and then the 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 turnover and the rest of the business and the alliances. Um, you know, we just see this company sorely uh, missing numbers and doing a major reset. I mean, what what would you say is the the most credible 
part of their argument or the bull argument for the stock. I mean, I can't find any other than that's obviously down a lot, right? I mean, I, I regret not taking a harder look at this company earlier uh, when it came public. Um, because what I, uh, you know, what we found obviously a lot of exaggerations in the story and maybe we should take a step back and talk about, you know, how the company positions its total addressable market, its TAM, its market share, its, as we talked about how it describes its customers, its sales cycle, um, its development costs. I mean, once we looked at pretty much all the company's claims, we find evidence of exaggeration or irreconcilable statements. Just to give an example, um, I think they were talking about a 250 million TAM in you know 20, 2020, whatever, and then six months later they changed it. Oh, you know, let's push that out four years. And their revenues obviously are 270 million, of which 30% are coming from one customer. So take their revenues divided by their TAM, you know, their market share is inconsequential, but yet they talk, I think it's like 10 basis points market share, but yet they talk about themselves as a leader in the industry. They also say they've sunk a billion dollars into developing this product. But yet, you know, other employees have made other statements. Um, so we get to a development cost of more 500 to 800 million. Um, there's just like a lot of exaggeration. The other point is the whole sales cycle. I mean, the, C the CEO recently made some, a statement that the sales cycle is like four and a half months and going down. But the former employees talk about a two year sales cycle. I mean, we're again, you're trying to sell an enterprise ticket for. 20 um, 20 million dollar software are you really going to sell that in four months no i mean the, the, you know these things take a long time so you know the the sort of the um hype around this company we think is finally starting to fizzle um and now it's become more evident obviously as they've um, been public and matured a little bit and i mean we're seeing the amendments from you know baker hughes etc um and so you know that's why we think the setup even though the stock is down you know, call it 70% from uh, from where it was a year ago, that still doesn't mean it can't go to zero. The only thing supporting it right now is the cash balance. They've raised, um, they have about a billion dollars, but they took on some, about a hundred million dollars of leases. They have some commitments to a digital transformation institute they're funding. They're gonna burn more cash, they have dilution. So still, I mean, we look one year out um, and we still get 40 to 50% downside. What, who is their biggest competitor in your opinion? You know, they say they don't have a competitor. <laughs> and, you know, I, when I saw that, I always said, well, what company doesn't have a competitor? And, you know, in talking to some of the former employees, it, it is sort of evident they, they don't have a true competitor. But then again, they have a product they can't really sell. So, what, you know, why should there be, if, if they're in a market that's so small that doesn't make money, that isn't really adding value, why would anyone want to compete in that market, right? Um, and so, yeah, they don't have a pure competitor, but what we've also learned obviously is the product itself is built on a foundation of 30 or 40 different other data and product integ you know, integrators into it. So it's, it's a combination of different technologies, which that in and of itself, again, makes it complex and a different, difficult, uh, difficult sell. So I mean, what did they say the TAM was again? What, what do they claim the TAM is? Um, something like 200, um, hold on a sec. Yeah, so in, in 2018, they were saying it was a 250 billion TAM by 2021. And then we found a press release, you know, a few months later, then they kicked it out to 2025, you know. Um, and so, and then also in the uh, prospectus, while going public, initially they said the TAM was, uh, I think they, they grew it from 170 to now 270. So it's a, it's a moving part, right? But my point was their revenue is only 200, call their revenue 260 million of which one customer is 30% of that. So you're a $260 million revenue company in a market that's 200, that you're saying is 270 billion. You're, you're, in, you're inconsequential, right? I mean, and, and why do you consider yourself a leader when your market share is 10 dips? Right, they're one thousandth of their claim, Tam. Um, yeah, I mean the, the story doesn't add up, right? Well, if they were a, a Series A startup, maybe, but um, yeah, it becomes harder to years. buy into as a public company. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, the the, the core of this business has been around since two thousand nine. So, um, again, this is not unique to C three. I mean, Spruce Point 
you know, as a common theme of a lot of our shorts, we've seen whether it was Lightspeed, which we talked about, Oatly, I mean, Task Us. I mean, these are businesses that started a decade ago, right? And, you know, why are they now coming public now? It's because the market will almost accept any company, crap or non-crap, to raise capital. And so the worst of the worst of the companies that have never really found a, a business model, never really made money, you're seeing, you're seeing come public. And we put, you know, C3 in that bucket. It also seems like the kind of business that might come at loggerheads with uh, a Palantir or some of these like kind of consulting technology shops that can offer a variety of, of solutions, maybe not just AI related. But it seems like the AI piece might be one of a number of things that some of the competitors provide. Maybe when they say they don't have true competitors, maybe it's it's just the focus on AI that that, that separates them. But um, I've never used the product, so I can't say. Yeah. Just, just so Palantir is uh, a name that Palantir is a name that comes up, but um, so do others, like you know Datadog, and but they say they partner with them. I think they may even buy part of Datadog Solution as part right. of their own. So you know, it's an amalga. It's the product's an amalgamation. Um, but whatever it is, <laughs> whatever it is, we can say definitively that it's not gaining broad market acceptance. You know, still to this day, there's a narrow customer base. And we'd even point out that the customer base appears to be shifting more towards government entities. Um, we use the Wayback Machine. We looked at the customer logos. If you look now, the, they're showing, they have a, a, a go to their customer page. They say, you know, high concentration of Fortune 500 companies. But if you look at the logos, it's mostly government logos. So, you know, the, the government and government contracts tend to be shorter and lower margin because they're, you know, competed out. So, you know, we see the business mix going the wrong way. We, you know, if this really were a, a company um, scaling, they'd be having more corporate logos, uh, but they're showing more government logos. So let's talk about uh, valuation a little bit. Um... What do you think is intrinsic value here, and, and what what metric are you looking at to come to your um, target price? Yeah, so like I said, I mean we're giving them full credit for the remaining the Baker Hughes revenue commitments. Uh, Baker Hughes has to deliver a certain amount of revenue for the next few years. Um, you know we NPV that. Um, we obviously take the cash on the balance sheet. We build in you know twelve months of cash burn. Uh, we think the street. Um, doesn't have the right debt number. They took on some operating leases with Google um, as a landlord. You know, we we kind of find that a little bit peculiar because they took out a 10-year, 100, you know, and $5 million lease for like 250,000 square feet, which is just enormous relative to this current size of the company. And the current company is shrinking because they're losing people. Um, so we don't quite understand what's going on with that. Um, then obviously we build in a lot of dilution. We think the street has the wrong share count. They have a lot of in the money options. Um, so the right share count probably in the next six to 12 months is on the order of 140 million shares. Um, and then we put a, a, a multiple on the non-Baker Hughes business, uh, which a little uh, again, we think is more government skewed. We put a discounted multiple to what you mentioned like a Palantir or a Splunk or whatever the, you know, four or five other big data AI stocks are. And, you know, uh, we get to 40 to 50% downside. Um, it's always a telltale sign when uh, a company over allocates to office space. <laughs> and, well, uh, this case is egregious. I mean, no, no, no shortage of, uh, an, you know, sort of anecdotal stories there of, you know, companies with, with offices, they probably should not have spent as much money. <laughs> yeah, we were we were baffled by that because um, you know they have a partnership with Google that, and they have and that's another thing that we talk about in the report. They've announced lots of partnerships and alliances with Hewlett Packard, with Intel, with Amazon, with Microsoft, Google Cloud, and then you know you go to each company's website and you kind of look to see okay, well what are they really getting out of this? And there's almost nothing about C3. I mean, we even went to Hewlett Packard and they talked about integration with, you know, a tightly integrated product with one of Hewlett Packard servers. And I asked the sales assistant, I said, you know, what's, uh, you know, tell me more about C3. And he knew nothing. You know, we went to Microsoft's website and I said, I'd like to learn more about, you know, how C3 works with Microsoft. And he directed me to C3's website. What kind of sales partnership is that? He, 
you know, I, I literally gave them an opportunity to sell me on C3 and they directed me right back to C3's website. So we have a lot of questions about the quality of these relationships, but with Google in particular, we have on slide 60, again, um, they just inked a $103 million 10 year lease with Google and um, for something on the order of 283 square feet. The company only has 600 something people. So it's a huge amount of lease space. I don't know what kind of growth they're, just, they're, they're expecting there, but um, something seems off and we're pressing the manager. We'd like to know why exactly they entered into this huge arrangement with Google. So one floor per, per employee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> um, that's really interesting. Um, so is this company cash flow positive or is this is this a heavily cash burning business? Yeah, I mean, this is it's a cash burning business and, you know, and there's nothing shareholders can do about it. That's another point we want to talk about is the governance here. Um, it's a dual class um, stock. So um, Mr. Siebel and his uh, close associate control like 95% of the class B. It's a super voting um, 50, uh, 50 uh, votes per share. Um, so, I mean, they pretty much can do what they want. The board, you know, we've criticized is pretty much stacked with allies of Siebel. And, you know, we just don't think they're suitable and can do an objective job for the public shareholders. I mean, we've noted that um, two of the directors uh, have ties to McKenna Capital. Um, we did a search on Mr. Siebel's um, IRS Family Foundation filings. It's very clear that McKenna Capital is managing money for his family foundation. So those directors, firms have gotten fees. Um, one of the directors is the Siebel and Down Computer Science Chair at Berkeley. So he's being indirectly funded by Siebel. Um, you know, one of the other directors served on Siebel's private holding company and was, you know, worked with him for a long time. I mean, three of the directors have been tied to corporate scandals that they don't put on their bios. I mean, we just don't think this is a great board. We don't think the structure is well. And, and also what's important to know about the structure with the dual class stock is that that limits institutional owners. So we think, we think the stock is heavily retail driven and we just don't think the retail investor base knows what they're, what they're buying here. And if they think that like Fidelity is gonna come in and buy a lot of stock because it needs to match the tech software you know, ETF, it's not gonna happen because the stock, a lot of the indexes are prohibited from owning um, particularly new IPOs that that have dual class structures. So it's really, you know, a, a mix of retail people, quant funds that are in this that we don't really think have done this deep dive work. And, and that, look, as I said, I mean, the stock's down a lot. We think it has more to go, but um, we don't think anyone's really done this work and explained, you know, why why has the stock gone from 100 to 25 and and why can't it go from 25 to 12? We've, we've laid it out for it uh, for, for the market to see and, and digest. Is this one of those like Kathy Wood arc names that's been pumped in? Like, I'm, I'm just trying to understand like where the, the appeal to retail would have been here. Like, how, was it hyped in social media? Was it a Reddit Absolutely. thing? Oh, I mean, it's incredibly hyped. Look at the CNBC. Mr. Siebel's been on CNBC seven times uh -huh. talking about, you know, AI ticker and his vision of how this company is going to dominate the world. So yeah, I mean, I think it's been incredibly promoted to retail and I think it's, um, you know, we felt we needed to do service to the market um, to give the different narrative here. And, and I think there's still analysts out there dangling hundred dollar price targets on the stock, which we think need to get cut and, and uh, need to reflect reality. I mean, the average analyst price target here is still 53 dollars so still double which is just unrealistic there's no conceivable way this stock is going to double when 50 percent of the executives just left within the three past three months i mean again we think this company is in an organizational disarray right now um so i think you know not only do revenue estimates need to come down earnings estimates but the price targets for the street need to be slashed to reality here how levered is the business it's not that levered again i um they have really a solid balance sheet. I'll, yeah. well, I'll be at their burning cash. They they did announce a stock buyback. We'll see, you know, what they're buying back. I, you know, I guess, hey, they issued stock in the 40s and, you know, um, maybe they think they're doing a service to shareholders by buying back at 25. But um, I think we've seen and I've seen a lot of wasteful corporate buybacks in my time. 
And uh, if I were uh, the company, I'd be looking at, I'd personally be looking at M&A diversification at this point, but um, they've made, you know, they've made some comments to the market that they're looking to grow organically and not looking at M&A as an inorganic growth angle. Um, have they bought anything recently that's, that's noteworthy? No. Yeah. And I'm um, not sure what they could buy. I mean, again, I, I, I don't see any adjacencies here. I mean, again, the product seems to be, seems to have a challenge differential, seems to have a challenge positioning itself in the market to begin with. So what, you know, what are they going to buy? It would have to be some adjacency yeah. or something. I, it's not very clear to me. Um, would you say the biggest risk here is that they get bought out? I see very little. No, I mean, you know, I think, look, you know, 30, assume 30% 30 of the revenue goes away. Um, you know, they say they've invested 800 million to a billion dollars, but that's a sunk cost. Um, one former employee, we, you know, asked, uh, I said to him, is there a takeout risk here? He said, yeah, maybe a $200 million market cap. The problem is, you know, as you know, technology moves fast, right? And so there's already companies that are um, innovating and, and trying to replicate what C3 has. We pointed out that, um, and this is important for the Baker Hughes revenue, that Baker Hughes itself invested in a very similar, what we think looks like a similar business to C3 called Augury. And they took a position on the board. So that's an Israeli company. So it already seems like the puck is going in one direction and the market's moving possibly away from C3. And as they have a, a you know, not only a sales brain drain, but, um, you know, if they lose, you know, product engineering people, like, I just don't see, you know, the product roadmap or, you know, why anyone would spend $3 billion on this company at the moment. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, that's, that's the mystery of the markets for you. <laughs> um, ben, unless there's anything you want to add, I think this is a really good summary. It seems like you've done a lot of, uh, primary research here and, and have talked to a lot of folks about the situation, including former employees. Um, yeah, uh, well, I think, look, I, I think, again, I think what we didn't touch on, which is also, uh, we want to make sure people review is our work on the accounting mm -hmm. uh, for this business, because let's not forget that Baker Hughes came under a little bit of scrutiny not long ago. You might recall um, Harry Markopoulos, the forensic investigator who, um, was uh, one of the early whistleblowers on Madoff, he turned his attention to GE's accounting. And you might recall part of that was that they were looking at whether or not GE was using Baker Hughes as a way to keep costs off the books. So there was somewhat of a, an overlap there. And here, you know, we have Baker Hughes in a transaction with C3. You know, we found some anomalies here in terms of the, the accounts receivable, gross margins, and unbilled receivables. Um, Spruce Point, we've done a lot of work in the past and have consistently warned uh, investors that when you start to see un unbilled receivables increase, uh, that leads to the potential of um, recording, you know, revenue or pulling forward revenue. And that's exactly what we've seen here in the Baker Hughes. Um, we've seen uh, unbilled receivables rise, and then we saw a discrepancy in accounts receivables being um, being uh, associated with Baker Hughes. And the, the delta in the accounts receivables we noticed correlate very closely to the unbilled receivables. Um, and so this is pointing us in the direction of, of possible um, you know, early revenue recognition. Um, we do notice that C3 has um, slightly beaten their revenue you know, targets each quarter. Now, bear in mind, they've also given very narrow revenue quarterly guidance and they've just barely beaten it so um you know there's this concern here that maybe they're they're managing uh you know the revenues from this uh, baker hughes uh, joint venture uh you know in a way to to beat numbers so take a look at that i mean when, when we sort of see that we, we uh we get a little caution there and then also of course the as i mentioned the gross margin that they're running uh, this JV at, at, is at a, almost 100% gross margin, which again, we asked a, a former employee knowledge about that. Is, is, is it possible that Baker Hughes is delivering 
this revenue with no costs? I mean, of course it's impossible. You know, they're, they're using the product plus they're selling the product. Of course, there's a cost associated with this joint venture. And, and, um, and so, uh, you know, C3 is booking 100%, almost 100% gross margin. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's the last point, right? Is that, you know, you have related party dealing, you have, um, you know, numbers that are looking suspicious. Um, you have pretty pretty bad governance here. You have a, a corporation in disarray with tremendous amount of turnover. And um, I think, you know, absent a product roadmap here or, you know, evidence that this company um, is going to gain broader market acceptance, I, I think you're sort of a, this is sort of a tech story that's adrift, um, just burning money every day. And so that's why we see, you know, nothing but slow downside here. It also seems like um, a service that people don't understand. And uh, I, I find that often in, in those scenarios where people don't really know what the product is, <laughs> there's more room for kind of hype and yeah. kind of, you know, some of the stuff with, um, you mentioned CNBC, and, you know, I think some of that promotional activity carrying the stock more so than it really should because people don't really get what, yeah. what's being sold. Um, but Ben, this is really, really enlightening. And um, I'll, I'll certainly add this name to my watch list to see, uh, see where it goes. And, um, you know, looking forward to the next one. No, always a pleasure. And uh, now you're right. This is, again, this, I think, is more sizzle than steak. And the ticker <laughs> says it all, AI. I mean, they really uh, hit it out of the park on this one in terms of the timing. And I mean, when that stock was at 170, uh, not only was management selling, but also Baker Hughes, as I mentioned, they had equity. Um, they've sort of cashed out. So um, look, I think they've um, net net made made pretty good on this. And uh, you know, I think unfortunately the retail investor at the end of the day is going to be the big loser here. Yeah, it's, that is unfortunate. Um, all right, Ben, we'll be in touch and uh, looking forward to seeing how this story folds out. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Take care, Ben.